Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Strange Love. Tonight is a little bit different as we are joined by a live studio audience. Hello, live studio audience. We have Verso and Brom, and is it Case <laughs> Organic or Amber? What would you like to be? Yay! And Media Chick. Hello. And as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello. And our very special guest this evening is Rick Tarosi. Hi. Yay, see, the crowd loves mm, great, you. Great, <laughs> great. And, and just in case anyone doesn't know who Rick is, Rick is the, as I like to put it, ever-vigilant narrator of the Portland tech scene at Silicon Florist. Yes, thank you. And that's your blog. That's, yes, that's my side project. And where is it located? Uh, SiliconFlorist.com. Yay! Yay! <laughs> so... It's been a really busy week for you. Yes. Because this is your third media-style appearance this week. Yeah. In, in media that I'm completely uncomfortable with. You're uh, uncomfortable. Yeah. He's uncomfortable on my couch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It'll be okay. All right. Pretty soon, it'll be painless. Just have a few more tiki sips. Yes. And it'll be have, fine. Some, have some tiki drink, and, and all the rum will mm-hmm. make everything go away. So earlier this week, you did a KGW appearance. Yeah, purely by accident. Um, that you crashed. <laughs> yeah, I basically crashed. Josh Bancroft was uh, had tweeted that he was getting interviewed by KGW mm-hmm. at OSCON. And uh, I was like, well, I'll go over and watch that, see what happens. And uh, the reporter was like, oh, you have an old iPhone. Well, we want to talk about the old iPhone more than we want to talk about the new one. And so I got pulled into the I think we're gonna. Thing. I think we're gonna get into that in a minute because I too have an old iPhone. Yeah, yeah. And then this morning, you were on OPB Radio, which I'm hoping went much more smoothly for you doing the show than it did for us listening to the show. <laughs> I heard about that. Yeah, the uh, FM radio. There were some hijinks this morning at my at my house. Twentieth century technology. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you'd been on the television or the computer. Yeah. Well, it was streaming. It, it streams on OPB. You hear that? It was streaming. So. Yeah. We have computers in this house, Dr. Normal. Yes, I know. Well, then I'd have to boot those up, and I just thought, FM radio, how hard is that? <laughs> Apparently, it's very hard. <laughs> it was 20 minutes and waking me up hard. Um, you talked about the open source convention and open source. Y- yeah, that. what happened there was I, I got a call from OPB uh, looking for people who could talk about open source stuff. So mm-hmm. I suggested, you know, Raven Zachary and Scott Kabeaton and, and Audrey Eshright, Uh and said, these are the people you should talk to. And they called me back later and said, great, you know, we've talked to all those people. They're brilliant. It's going to be perfect. And we'd love to have you on there, too. And I'm like, uh, okay. But So this is where you're a lot more like me than, than I'd be comfortable with because you are not good on the tech side of things, on the heavy, heavy tech side of things. N- no, no, I'm not. I mean, uh, I have a great deal of appreciation for mm-hmm. it and uh, a great deal of admiration for people who can do it but uh-huh. uh, you know I'm not the the geeky guy I can I can do some coding but probably my best code was written in 1978 on a TRS-80 <laughs> in basic when I wrote a really sweet Pac-Man program that's about the last best Pac-Man code is I wrote yeah awesome. back yeah. when men were men and computers were that's real right. computers uh, press play and record and exactly. then hit save mm-hmm. and, and yeah that was awesome. But you find yourself heavily engrossed in the geek culture and the technology culture. It, yeah, thankfully so. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's it, they've been, you know, very welcoming for for somebody who's not exactly a technical person. So I, you know, feel really privileged to be part of that. Actually. So what is it that you do that keeps you so in line with that culture? I think. That's a, that's a really good question. I think I've spent enough time um, in my previous careers with engineers mm-hmm. and software development and, and that kind of thing that uh, I, I know what they go through. Mm-hmm. And, and I know, um, you know, it, it, like Brahm and I have had this conversation about the fact that they're creative as well and they're, and, yeah. and they're they're not just mechanics they're they're doing something they're, they're solving problems and 
and they're um they you know they're, they're just doing amazing things and mm-hmm. and i i think uh, uh hopefully my appreciation of that comes through and i think that causes them to kind of tolerate i, me I think it really around. does come through <laughs> yeah okay good because um yeah because i mean i just i like i think there's a bunch of cool stuff going on in portland that people need to know about and quite frankly the people doing the cool stuff aren't really interested in telling anybody about it so i no, kind of took it upon yeah. myself to help tell that story so with that you spent a lot of time at oscon this week i did yeah and and that was totally over my head yeah. um you know it <laughs> was it was very much You're not the only one yeah and it was great it was you know it, <laughs> it was it was it was really um really interesting to kind of be an observe a pure observer Mm -hmm. in that regard because so many conferences I go to I'm either doing something there or it's it's pertinent to something I'm doing and this I was just purely observing and and talking to people and just kind of you know hanging out listening and learning from them and it's really like that stuff is super amazing like building operating systems and you know and and things that work together in open space and whatnot it was a, a really amazing and um and just a really really interesting group of people so from the non-tech perspective from the outsider's point of view what were some of the more interesting things that went on there or that were discussed there um i think the the, the one of the most interesting things to me there were a lot of corporate um people there i mean like microsoft was there yahoo google Mm-hmm. Um, Microsoft. Know, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, That's interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and I didn't, the people I wouldn't expect to see. Do they go to the Shuttleworth conversation, <laughs> perhaps? <laughs> I, they, they may have. And, uh, and I, I, that was the most surprising to me. I think the other thing that was, um, it, it, not surprising, but it, it has a different vibe than some of the other tech conferences I've been to. I mean, these are the people who are doing the the heavy lifting, mm-hmm. as it were, with technology. And um, there's a much different. I mean, they're they're much more. I mean, they're into it, and it, they're very focused, and, and and it's very cool. I mean, they're very passionate about it, yeah. but um, not not in a way that I'm passionate about tech. I mean, they I, they are passionate about it and they can actually do something well, about it. Correct me if I'm wrong with open source, it's not just about the coding and, and getting the stuff done, but once you get it out there, it, it becomes more of a communal thing. People help one another out, they share things. Exactly, and, yeah. And that makes it have a life of its own. Right, and and it's 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 constant iteration. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there, there are people within the open source community that help manage the code mm-hmm. and, you know, deal with the releases and, and the committing the code and that kind of thing. But it's just a really, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really iterative kind of creative process kind of, and, and very, I don't know how to describe it, but like it takes a lot of courage to build something and throw it out there and go, can somebody improve upon this? You know, this yeah. is the best I could do right now can you do something better with it and kind of work through that process? It's real. I mean, more power to them. Yeah. That's not something I could do. Yeah. No, no. Mm. <laughs> really? You want to criticize me? Yeah, exactly. Oh no, you can't make this better. I did it. Yeah. Ah! yeah. So yeah. there again, I mean, interesting crowd. Just, I mean, and, uh, and a lot of really good, um, you know, Portland representation mm-hmm. there. I mean, it, it really struck me how involved Portland is in this when, when, the rock stars you see walking around are people you see at beer and blog or at lunch 2.0. Mm-hmm. I mean, or they work for companies that are here in Portland. I mean, it was really, it was really impressive. Do you think that Portland is unique that way? I, I listened to the show this morning and I retained some knowledge, but it was very early. <laughs> Do you think that Portland is unique in its em- embracing open source? I think there's something about our culture that really syncs up with open source, that Mm -hmm. creativity, that kind of, um, you know, wanting to, that kind of utilitarian, Mm -hmm. you know, wanting everything to be good for everybody, be it, be it green energy, be it, you know, recycling, be it, you know, open source to me is recycling. I mean, it's really, it's really using, it's using a resource and it's reusing retooling yeah. it until yeah. it cu- until it works like it should and yeah. so that mindset very much fits in with the whole kind of 
kind of Portland vibe. And I think the whole um, kind of communal collaboratory nature of kind of the small town Portland feel, I mm-hmm. think that plays really well in in the whole open source space as well. That's one of the things that's always impressed me about Portland. I, I was not born and raised in Portland. I moved to Portland when I was 17 years old. Mm-hmm. And I've always been impressed with the fact that Portland em- seems, it's such an embracing city in a way. It really seems to latch on to things and to, to incorporate things, incorporate things as its own mm-hmm. and then to move on and run with them. Yep. Yeah. I think you see that, um, you know, in the startup scene, you're, you're mm-hmm. seeing that. I mean, most of the successful successful startups here have come from somewhere else. I mean, Jive's come from somewhere else, and Vadoop mm-hmm. now has come in from somewhere else. And and but um, Intrigo is another agency that's come from somewhere else. But what, it's um, what isn't? I'm I'm familiar with Jive uh-huh. and with Vadoop. Yeah, everyone can see my lovely Vadoop helmet. Lovely. <laughs> I like to caress my Vadoop helmet. Um, was it Intrigo? I'm not familiar with Intrigo. They are from uh, Tucson, mm-hmm. and they're really um, <clears throat> they're really kind of a, an agency that helps startups develop. And they're like smart hands to help startups oh, develop okay. applications. So if you have an idea, and you know your engineering team is strapped or whatever, mm-hmm. they would be somebody you could bring in to help develop those applications. And they decided to move the whole company to Portland just because they'd been here a couple times and really liked the vibe and, and, and because we were so welcoming, they showed up to ignite and, you know, thought it was great. Came mm-hmm. to a few beer and blogs and suddenly now they're here. So Portland has that effect on yeah, people. I know totally. And it's, and, and I think that same thing happened with the Vadoop people coming mm-hmm. up to visit and, you know, it, we do a really good job of, um, of kind of welcoming people into the fold because I think so many of us have come to Portland not being native like Mm -hmm. you know that that was it was a decision to move here a decision to live here for a particular lifestyle Mm -hmm. and and there's a certain amount of respect that comes when you're like oh yeah i was right you're gonna you're gonna want to come live here too so come on be part of the crowd kind of thing i don't know what it is but i find myself trying to convince people no no portland's wonderful you want to live here i'm like do i really want that many more people to move here but yeah i freaking love portland i know and it's hard i mean i you know it we do that kind of stuff all the time, just mm-hmm. like pitching the city. And even jokingly, I mean, there were some people at OSCON who were like, yeah, I've been to Portland a couple of times. I really like it. And we like we descend upon them. And it's like, <laughs> so you're moving here when exactly? And, that you know, happens when, on and, Twitter a lot, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. will move yeah. to Portland. Like Steve's wrong. Steve's wrong. He's Hi, like, Steve. oh, you know, I kind of kind of like, you know, he's our, you know, he's a Portlander. He is. We he's just a- need to get him to move here. Yeah. So well, I think what you want to do is get juiced to move here. You get right? the whole yeah, that would be great <laughs> actually to have the the whole shooting match move here. But mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah, it's that kind of stuff where, again, in a collaboratory way, somebody asked the question and twenty yeah. people start answering it yeah. for them. So yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting dynamic. I don't get that a lot of other places. No, I uh, Portland is the first place that I ever moved to willingly. I moved a lot when I was a kid, and when. Uh, I had the choice. I moved to Portland, and when I had the choice to stay or leave, I I stayed. Yeah, I, exactly the same way. This yeah. was the first place I moved, not because of school or a job or a family move. It was a, it was a decision that I liked the place. I was going to move there and figure out what happened from yeah. there. So, yay Portland! Yay. So, uh, so at OSCON, I mm-hmm. mean, c- can you like tell us uh, some of the things that really strike you as interesting? I mean, companies or some projects that people are doing, just things that you're seeing that, you know, that's what excites you um, when you're writing The Silicon Florist. Yeah, you know, the uh, the OSCON stuff, it's like, for me, the, it was very much out of my realm. I think the, so the whole thing was exciting to me. I mean, they'd touch on some things where they'd be like, you know, there'd be XMPP and Jabber or something, which would be interesting. There'd be, um, you know, community building kind of things that were really interesting um but i think the thing that i actually that i actually got most excited about was kind of this epiphany moment i had that i now understand why there are open apis and why the web is becoming more and more open and why we have things like open social and that kind of thing it's because these people down at the core 
with the open source are kind of creating that type of culture and it's bubbling up to services that are built on top of that kind of open source code. So how, so how about wait, wait, the... Um, what's an API? It's an application programming, programming interface. Thing. Thank and, you. And it, <laughs> it, basically what that says is I have some data or functionality in my system mm -hmm. and I'm going to allow you to share it. Okay. I'm going to allow you to use it. So Twitter has an API. Twitterific uses the Twitter API. I love Twitterific. Yeah. How so they plug that into the Twitter site is an okay. API, and there's a you know there's a little discussion that takes place between those two, and mm -hmm. then they can share data back and forth. So. Okay. Thank you. So I was going to ask. Um, you were talking about um, the community that's being built. And one of the announcements was this, uh, was it Open Web Foundation? Open, Open Web, Web Foundation, so yeah. How do you see that playing in? I mean, I think there was some confusion. And when I read it, I was kind of like, so how is this different from W3C? And what what's the difference right. here? Well, I think the, uh, I kind of equate it, for the Portland folks, I equate it to what Legion of Tech is doing around here. So mm -hmm. the idea is that there are all these little groups working on things. And they're going to need help with, intellectual property issues. They're going to need help with developing a foundation or funding to continue their development. And rather than have each of them try and build a 501c3, what they're going to do is build this umbrella organization that will say, we'll serve as that kind of business part mm -hmm. for you. Um, and, and the other thing is they're not, they're not a standards body. They're working on specifications. So and helping people develop specifications. So really what they will be helping do is drive standards down into the into the development. I think that's that's the piece that was a little confusing yeah. for me because most standards bodies that I'm familiar with, you know, they they, they have the specification and the standards and it's kind yeah. of a uh, you know, you you go here, you go to IEEE, you go to IETF, mm -hmm. you know, obviously I work with protocols a lot. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um but that that was the interesting piece for me, the specification versus the standards. Yeah, I think they and I think they sit in a very interesting spot because the standards organizations are saying this is what is accepted and 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 the the Open Web Foundation has the opportunity to say, Okay, developers, here here are the standards to which we mm -hmm. should subscribe and they also can communicate back the other way with um they can so if developers are talking to the Open Web Foundation, they can communicate back to the standards organizations and say, you know, here are some of the things we're needing in in the stand. So they become a real mm -hmm. sit in kind of an interesting you know spot, and and the people who are behind that group um, are just a, an amazing group of people. I mean, if anybody's going to get this stuff done, it's it's the people on that group. So I'm really interested to see what happens there. So this is kind of like a new kind of a new concept or a new model in a way. Yeah, this in a group. way. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's another group that's been working on it, but from the data standpoint. So there's the data portability. Group, oh, right, okay. But they're right. focused on who owns the data and where does the data go. And, and what Open Web is saying is, before we can even get to what data is being shared, we need to be sharing that data in the same way. We need mm -hmm. specifications for how that data is transferred so mm -hmm. yeah so it's interesting i mean and, and you know it, it, it'll be interesting to see where that goes i don't know if i read it on your blog but you mentioned the reason you started the silicon florist you you you, you used as an example like the selwood b or the multnomah village yeah uh, yeah yeah paper like these local mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood papers yeah i well i yeah i started to equate it to something like willamette week and then i was like eh, you know i don't even think it's that <laughs> like yeah. it's it's more so would be kind of um it, really because i think the i started doing it for portland for because there was a lot like i would talk to one person who was doing something and I talked to another person who was doing something. I'd say, well, are you talking to so-and-so? Because they're doing something very similar. Mm -hmm. It'd be good if you guys worked together. And they're like, I had no idea. And this wasn't was being covered by, say, the business journal? or No, or it's way, journal. way below that kind of radar. Right. And, it, and the other thing that was frustrating is, you know, none of the major tech blogs were covering it either. Because mm -hmm. they weren't Portland-based? or it, it just, they weren't. They weren't reaching national. They, you know, they mm -hmm. they're not necessarily well, funded. They're not necessarily so TechCrunch and Ohm. They're really Silicon Valley based. Yeah. You know, so yeah. if you get outside of Silicon Valley, you know, there's not a lot of coverage there. Right. 
right and blogs and and you know quite frankly the most interesting stuff i was seeing happening wasn't I mean, I cover a lot of businesses now, but mm-hmm. I originally started covering it because the side projects were really interesting. You know, there's there's things like, you know, Unthirsty or Grab It or, you know, other little coding, you know, Caligator. Like, they, there are these coding projects that people are just getting together and doing as a side project that are, as I, you know, one of my things I always say is like, in any other town, that would be a company right now. <laughs> but in Portland, it's like, we're, we're just going to do it. We're it's just playing. part of the ecosystem. Yeah. We're, we're playing gonna, with it. Yeah, yeah, we're going to figure it out, yeah. and maybe we'll do something with it later. So, um, so th- And those were the people who were like, you know, th- the last thing they want to be is business people or marketing types. I mean, mm-hmm. so I, I was like, there's an opportunity there to, to help get some, you know, shine a spotlight on those people and show the cool stuff that they're doing. And... And I really had no idea it would be it, it sheer dumb luck that um, it just kind of took off like it did. I had no idea that how, that was. How happen. long has the blog been up? It'll be a year old in August. Oh wow! It's yeah. a, I remember reading the announcement, but it See. seemed like it was ages I know, ago. I know. It's, it's like your crazy. ten year anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations! Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. See, yes, in internet, internet years, internet very years. much yeah. so. Um, the right, thing a year is, the, is a very can, long time. I can even follow your blog, and as I've said before, I'm not really that tech oriented, but I read it just to keep up on what's well, God going knows, on. I know we were reading it 20 years ago when we started yeah. this 20, podcast. Yeah, 20 you know, years uh, ago, uh, you know, uh, 27 yeah. years ago, we're back on real when. to real tape. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and that's that's another good point. Is I think because I'm not a terribly technical person, like I try to explain the stuff that's going on in a mm-hmm. way that's more approachable. I mean, I love hearing these people describe what they're doing in really, really geeky terms. And then if I can distill that into something if you that, can translate. that anyone can yeah. understand, then I feel like I'm providing something for the whole thing. Speaking of some really geeky people, mm-hmm. we have a lovely studio audience this evening. Yay for our studio audience. And I'm wondering if any of our studio audience have questions for Mr. Terosi. Does anyone have a question they want to ask? These guys ask me questions all the time. Yeah, they. You're too accessible. I know. I need to. I need to my walled garden. You should have said yeah. no. I will yeah. not do strange love. You guys, <laughs> yes, forget it. Obviously, not good enough so for me. This is the Doctor Phil portion of the show. So. <laughs> to Identify yourself first. I'm Case Organic on Twitter. And uh, Amber Case in real life. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, to Rosie, I was wondering, um, Scobalizer has this sort of five-minute way of dealing with like thousands and billions of emails. Mm-hmm. Do you also have a, a similar way of dealing with the infinite emails that come into your account? Um, I've actually been... It's interesting you say that because um, emails, I would say no. In fact, I, I owe Cam and Chaos and a number of Hello. other people a... Uh, uh, Martin and Miss Burroughs and a number of other people who've sent me <laughs> per- personal emails recently that have completely fallen by the wayside because I've been so underwater on other stuff. But I do, the, the place I do have somewhere where I'm like, kind of like, yeah, I've kind of figured out how to manage this flow of information is Twitter. Um, and which is my newswire for, for Portland. Um, that's kind of where I listen to, to see what's going on and where I hear things and where I, you know, get the chance to kind of talk to people and say, is this real? Are you just mucking around? You know, what's going on? Um, and uh, the way I manage a lot of that is through RSS feeds. Um, you know, that I can't watch it all the time, but I can go back and catch up through RSS and, and, uh, and you know, some stuff with Yahoo Pipes to kind of muck it has, all together. Has Twitter become the main communication vehicle for this whole ecosystem of folks? Yes. I mean... It has. <laughs> no, it has. Yeah. It really has. Yeah. I mean, show of hands. I know when. Hello. Yeah. How do we all know? It? Well, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. Verso. With one exception. Yeah. The only way, with the exception of Verso, yeah. everyone else I know through Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't have met any of you. Uh, is that a phenomenon that's like six months old? I mean, Twitter's been around for a little while longer, but Twitter's been around for a little while. It's really, again, yet another Portland. 
thing. Yeah. Like Portland has really glommed on to well, Twitter. We love whales. Portland we do love, love whales. Whales, <laughs> whales yes. on our coast yes. and whales on our Twitter. Mm. We love Twitter we love and whales. The whales. Well, I, I I think we've talked about it, you know, quite a bit that there are so many people who are either working from home or telecommuting or, you know, and Verso mentioned this again today. It's it's like the water cooler for Portland. You know, I mean that's mm-hmm. how we all kind of stay in contact and um it's really been the way that you know you can tune in and out of the conversation when you want to and and portland just seems portland has a love-hate relationship with twitter i think we also tend to be the chief people who complain about it when when the fail whale shows up we're a little whiny we are a little (laughs) whiny aren't we i mean we're like and, and but when it's up like nothing but just like Smiles oh, and kisses. It's and all sunshine and yeah, roses. Exactly. We've all tried. We've all tried plurk. Plurk. Yeah, yeah. And what's the other one? Identica. Identica. Identica is interesting. The um the uh, the Identica guy was actually here for yeah. Oscon. And, oh, um, hello, Identica and, guy. Yeah, Evan, and he uh, was nice enough to swing by beer and blog. And um, actually, is Don P. Don P. in the in the room? Hey, Don P. Are uh, you there? Um. He, he's got an Identica. Uh, Identica works like email servers. Mm-hmm. So instead of everything having to go in one spot, it you could have s- different servers talking to one oh, another. So it's so a d- distributed system. Distribu- it's a federated <laughs> system, yeah. yeah. And Don P actually... Kind of like P2P. Like file train, like, yeah, like, like good old Torrent or, or Torrent like or something. Yeah, yeah. Or even like pop email kind of yeah. stuff. I mean, your email server knows to talk out there and mm-hmm. it winds up at another email server and everything seems to work magically see how mm-hmm. technical i am but the the um, just like me yeah, it's very the, impressive yeah. i en- i enjoy it quite the, a bit <laughs> but identica does very much that same way so don p don p has a identica server running mm-hmm. a test server running for just basically portland like we could use that as our Twitter, mm-hmm. as it were and then if, even if every other identica server went down portland could still talk to Portland kind but of thing. But what do you think it is about Twitter? I, from a personal standpoint, yeah. and maybe likely for you if you're a Twitterific user, I love the ability to use a client mm-hmm. to access it's Twitter nice. information. And it I is also, super nice. like, even though their SMS is really screwy right now, it's the best kind of, which, you know, being able to text a Correct. message in. That's a really good interface. Yeah. And, and um, sheer volume. Yeah, I think it, you can't find as many people on any other service no. as you can on Twitter. A few people so. move to Identica, but pretty much everyone's on Twitter. I think we have another audience oh. question, Ms. Verso. This is actually from the chat room. Mm. Hello, the chat room. illustrious G. Walter Hi. would like yeah. to know. Hi, G. Walter. Rick, G. Walter wants desperately to be like you. He would like to know <laughs> what you... He would like to know... I have to preface the question with he would like to be like you. Mm-hmm. And he wants to know what you have for breakfast. Oh my goodness. What a wonderful question. Well, he's had breakfast with me. <laughs> Has we, he? We've gone out to breakfast at Fat City before. I want, wait, where know. did you go to breakfast? Uh, Fat City in Multnomah Village. Yeah. They have good bacon. They do have good bacon. They have a quite Which tasty can, chicken really? fried steak as well. Oh God, chicken fried steak is good. Good old gravy on it. But, so um, what, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you yeah, eat I'm breakfast? kind of like, a, you know... Chicken fried steak, biscuits and gravy. Kind so of on a normal day, like you wake up in your oh, house. Oh, I generally don't eat. I don't eat all day, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. Is there? Are there any other questions from the peanut gallery? Mm-hmm. So, okay. Uh, my name is Bram. Bram Pitoyo. <laughs> Hello, and Bram. Jean Welcome, and VK Bram. from Twitter is asking, okay, let's talk about friend feed. Who can manage that amount of, in- of information? It's like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. So I guess how you would manage all that yeah, I've saw, I saw a lot of take up on friend feed during that Twitter mm-hmm. kind of bad time at mm-hmm. Twitter. And friend feed again, I haven't found a good client that works. Uh, Twirl, yeah. Twirl will read friend feed and will give you that kind it's of, but you don't same. really capture the flavor of what's yeah, going it's not on the there. Same. Um, I use friend feed primarily to uh, like things. Like, I'm like, oh, glad you posted that. And like that, <laughs> like that, like that. But I don't use it for conversation. So yeah. it's not, and to me, it's more like, Positive pats and positive it's a, reinforcement. Yeah, good yeah, boy, yeah. Good, you boy. Think, good job. You, yeah. re, you were really smart to do that. But the, um, but it's it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, it's it's an interesting way to to catch up on information. I think and to think what other and to, to see what other people are thinking mm-hmm. um, in one spot. The way you can't 
on Twitter. You can't follow, con- you know, yeah. people have built tools um, to kind of thread things together, but you can't really follow conversations mm-hmm. on Twitter the way you can on friend feed. So, I mean, that's. I have one final question before we go. How many people do you follow on Twitter? I'm glad you asked that because, you know, there's been the recent follower following kind of thing. And mm-hmm. everybody was like all upset because they're like, oh, I lost this many people following me or whatever. And I was concerned because I lost like 300 people I was following uh, yeah. that, that I couldn't figure out who I, who I, I think at last, uh, last time I checked, it was right about 1900, Gee, eight, 18, 1800, mini Christmas. 1886. So if you're closest is about 1900 mm-hmm. and it fluctuates a little bit given the way the Twitter's reporting. But I'm also, let me preface that with, I'm behind on about 300 following back requests. <laughs> so so it could be upwards of almost 2,200 people that I'd be following by the time I catch up on that. People love Rick Terosi. Oh, yeah. Lots of love. You've been a lovely, lovely guest uh, on the Tech much. Podcast. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.